Welcome to another episode of the Headlight Restoration Pro, where I'll be showing you how to take headlights like these and turn them into something like this on this rare and very nice Lexus SUV. Why is the study important? The is important because driving at night is three times as risky as driving during the day. The Headlight Restoration Pro. Let's get down to business. This is a rather rare vehicle. I've only done uh, maybe two other ones of these over a couple year basis. This is a 2014 Lexus GX 460. And it's a rather difficult light. If you can see here close up, you see that dip. It's kind of like a wave mixed with a bunch of round points and a bunch of uh, hard to get to or hard to service areas. Uh, because of those drastic waves, you kind of have to uh, really know how to finesse this one. Uh, it's not just a uh, blunt force instrument on this light, like when you're using uh, uh, you know, high speeds on a flat light. As you see there, I'm using the double stuff method. What you want to do when you have these exotic curves like this. Uh, this one is a little bit different because it has like a reverse dip and then like a round dip. And, you know, of course, as you see here, you always want to start on those trouble areas first. Um, you know, you want the pad to be, or the disc to be, uh, pretty much everything that you're using to be at its freshest point. That way you won't have to work that hard in those, uh, specific, uh, danger zones or hard to, um, you know, hard to reach areas. You want it to, you know, hit there one time and it'd be good. Like if you did it vice versa, when the uh, disc or pads or anything get worked in or almost done, now you're working 10 times as hard in a 10 times harder spot, which makes no sense. If you want to work 10 times harder on the easy spot, I mean, who cares? That's what it is. It's an easy spot. So it, you know, kind of balances itself out. So always use a fresh disc uh, and, or use your discs at its freshest point on those very uh, hard to reach areas. What you saw, I started right there with that reverse dip. That's kind of a wave, uh, which is the hardest part. The above part here, which is a lump or like an undulation, um, it is... Uh, hard as well, but nowhere near as hard to achieve uh, the proper grind or uh, removal on that area there, uh, which is like a reverse, um, you know, dip, which is like kind of like, you know, the whole thing together is like a wave like this. And, um, you know, that is the hardest part. And when I say hard, let me clarify what I mean by hard. It's harder to get in there and to achieve the removal process and achieve the clarity in your finished product without uh, eating it up or leaving a bunch of scratches that you have to correct or, um, you know, you know, possibly burning if you're trying to grind too hard or too, uh, too much with a greater um, uh, dip or whatnot, uh, you know, it's more prone. It's, it's, you know, 10 times more prone than say this area here where it's, uh, typically it's a little rounded there, but typically flatter. Um, being that there's so much going on there, even in the corners or near the uh, tape where the headlight meets the car, um, it's just much higher risk of, uh, damaging or much higher risk of you having to sit there and mess with that light for 15, 20 minutes when you can take two minutes to do it. Uh, that's the difference. That's why I say hardness. Um, and in some cases, uh, that's hardness for someone of my level, which is, um, you know, pretty much the highest level you can get to. Uh, there's people on that level, don't get me wrong, but I mean, I am at the level of eliteness, the highest level, not to toot my own horn, just trying to explain to you guys. That's a hard area for me. So, being it's a hard area for me, more than likely for you, it's going to be a really difficult area. Okay, so I'm just giving you the heads up when you're doing this vehicle or vehicles with uh, weird, freaky, kinky curves like this. You really just want to slow down. If you see me, I'm moving fast or whatever, but don't be me. Uh, you know, go at your, you know, do what I do, but go at your own pace. Uh, I have a lot of questions all the time about what speed do you use your drill on? There's two speeds, okay? Uh, well, with any given drill, even my polisher, there's uh, two speeds. 
Okay, one just kicks it into higher gear, you know, and the other is lower gears. Okay, but with either one, you can adjust the speed by how you feather or squeeze the trigger, how hard you squeeze it, how light you squeeze it. It will change the speeds damn near to you know damn near to nothing, just barely rotating to going you know seventeen hundred RPMs per minute. I'm blasting stuff with seventeen hundred uh, RPM per minute, but you got to know um, it's hard to distinguish, um, especially with Without the untrained eye, uh, how much I'm feathering it in so in certain areas, in those bad areas that are along the edges and along the lights, I'm actually th throttling down maybe 500 RPM. Okay, and when I hit those flat areas, I'm gunning it up to about 17, 1750 RPM, something like that. Okay, and um, like I always advise people, if you're just starting out, or even if you're a professional and you're using um, you're using, you know, used to doing stuff by hand or, you know, uh, whatever, you know, I would advise, uh, you know, starting with the low end uh, for quite some time. I mean, I, I use the low end. Um, uh, I mean, I use the low end and also I used a drill that was much slower than this. Uh, you know, I started with a, um, what was it, a Black & Decker drill. I still have both of them that I started with. I uh, just outgrew them and needed more power and more variability in the delivery of the power. And um, I started with those, and they have uh, maybe maybe a third of the power of this drill. And um, you know, and then when I got this drill or the other one that's smaller than this, which both have more power, I started on the one, and I started you know real slow, or whatever, just to get used to it. And you'll see why, because you know, even as I started to inch into um, going faster. I hit a bunch of hiccups, a little, you know, burn spot here, a little this and that, which is what you can fix most of the time. But some things you can't fix. You have to mask. You have to, um, you have to, uh, you know, deal with one way or another. Uh, but you want to stay away from those at all costs. Um, but yeah, I know how to fix all those and uh, do most of those things like that. And those things don't come up too much because I've learned. But you have to, you know, you can't just jump into it like this because you're gonna start running into those problems, and you don't want those problems. Best just to uh, inch up into it. Okay, as I see here, um, lights like this, uh, you know, with all this stuff going on, it's good to uh, use a lot of hand sanding uh, for this light or for these lights with these exotic turns and curves and dips. Uh, as you see here, I'm using an interface pad in the same uh, second uh, P500 disc by hand with the interface here getting all those hard to reach areas and once you realize and establish that you have hard to reach areas that are butted up to the uh, surrounding area that you've taped off you want to kind of uh, only hit those as close as you can and then go ahead and uh, finish with the uh, hand sanding methods uh, just because it's safer and there's no need to just sit there and try to grind against the tape that much because uh, you will grind through it uh, so a lot of these areas um, uh, I took it right to the edge and then you know uh, just a little bit of you know hand sanding will take the rest of it right off um, so pretty much uh, hand sanding is uh, king when it comes to these lights that have a lot of dip and a lot of uh, rigids and bumps and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> you want to go ahead and use um, this is the P800 right here. You want to go ahead and use uh, the drill as much as you can, but those hard to reach areas, don't force it. Don't force it, you know, because you know, um, it's not worth the risk. Uh, when you can just take a little more time and a little um, a little more finesse and get those areas out. And like I said, always, with the P500, those are the demolition crews, okay? Once you hit this, uh, you know, the demolition crews, uh, you know, on, on a job site, you know, they're just breaking everything down, tearing everything up. And then another crew comes in and, uh, you know, they pretty much clean that stuff up before they can start building and stuff, right, or rebuilding. So that's what this one is. This is the crew that comes in and uh, rebuilds stuff as what you want to think of the P800 as. You don't want to sit there and be using the P800 for removal. It's not really a removal disc. This is um, the cleanup crew uh, to, uh, you know, this is the cleanup disc to clean up all the uh, scratches and, and debris and messed up stuff that the other disc left behind. 
Uh, it's pretty much, uh, you know, in stages. It's each one leaves a little bit of something behind until you start hitting the polishing steps. So the method and the ideology behind this is pretty much uh, removing stuff and pretty much uh, leveling out those crevices and swirls and striations you left behind from removing stuff. And, you know, one step at a time, a little bit less with each step until we get to the polishing step, which is basically uh, removing all of those and filling in all that stuff. And then you get to the spray step, which is clear coating and protecting and filling in any little tiny thing you left behind that might be microscopic or barely able to see with your eye. But you see right here, don't be afraid to use the double stuff with the hand sanding method um, or the hand sanding step. Okay, right here I'm using the double stuff. I'm using the double stuff all the way through this whole process. If you don't know what the double stuff method is, uh, go ahead and check out this video here. I made this a couple months back. Uh, I had a lot of questions. People were asking me, what is that you're doing there? And, uh, you know, and I had to explain to uh, them about the double stuff in this video here. And it's pretty much uh, pretty interesting. You'll learn a lot about it. Uh, just think about, uh, you know, these curved surfaces with a flat end piece. What are you going to do? You got to have it more like a pillow, correct? So go ahead and check that video out. It's very informative. And if you are a headlight restorer, and if you're just trying to do one headlight, depending on what kind of headlight you have, you want to watch that video. Guaranteed. But yes, this uh, hand sanding method here with the P800 is, as you can see, how much smoother and lustrous that looks instead of all choppy and swirly and whatever. It pretty much um, smooths out the headlight going from that side to side or that up and down. It smooths it out and just, um, you know, the actual uh, surface of it. And it also smooths out any kind of striations or um, swirls that you get left behind from the other discs. At this point, uh, before the hand sanding, it's really uh, before the um, uh, hand sanding side to side after you use the P800 with the uh, power drill, they're very minimum. So once you do the side to side hand sanding, they're even more minimum. Okay. It's um, a must step on certain lights. Um, well, really, in my opinion, all lights. Um, I used to not use it until I figured out uh, this step when I ran into certain issues uh, with, uh, you know, seeing scratches or striations behind certain areas and, and just not uh, satisfied with my overall smoothness. This is a step that adds a ton of clarity, smoothness, and just um, visible luster back into the light. Okay, after that, you're going to go here with the water in the 3000 Trizac pad. Uh, this is a magic pad. There's only one place that I know of that makes it, and that's 3M. I try to use as many 3M products as possible. Okay, why is that? Okay, let me just uh, not sugarcoat it and just give you a shock that, I, that you might not have heard or you've heard me say before. 3M products, and, and here, let me, let me let me reiterate this once again, too. I don't get paid by 3M. I don't get paid by anybody from 3M. I wish I did. Believe me, you, because I would love to promote something that I fully back and I know from my research is adequately correct and from my usage is correct, okay? Um, by the way, this is uh, just normal uh, glass cleaner, okay? Um, and a microfiber towel, ultra uh, fine microfiber towel or premium, shall we say. Uh, but anyways, 3M products are going to be the best products in the world, okay? You're not going to find nothing better. If, if whatever you're needing that you're using, if you switch up to the 3M product version, you're going to be mind blown. You're not going to understand what's going on. And let me tell you why that is. It's because 3M is one of the biggest uh, manufacturers, uh, biggest company of chemicals and other abrasives and things like that in the world. Okay. It, it probably is the biggest. Okay. It has stock options. If you want to go buy stock right now of 3M, you can get on uh, Stash or whatever else, you know, Robinhood, or you can go through your broker and you can buy 3M stock. Okay. It has been around here for decades. It's going to be around here for decades more. They have not only have stock, I means they're on Wall Street and all that stuff like that. They have um, 
they have uh, probably endless, you know, um, high paid scientists that are working on all their products. Their products have so much money and capital backing them that they're going to be so much more extreme than any other product, whether it's their waxes, their sealants, their, you know, whatever it is they have. They don't make everything. There are going to be some things they haven't got into yet, okay, because there's only one company. But they make so much stuff you'd be surprised. You know, their polishes, their cleaners, their pads, their discs, anything, their their power tools, anything is going to be better than anything else you can use. Uh, I've got to go ahead and change power. Pro tip there. If you have a lot of batteries and you want to distinguish which ones are bad, just put a piece of tape on the end. That's how I do. Um, but anyways, nothing can compare. And I've tried to put their stuff against everything else as far as creams, as far as waxes far as uh you know tire greaser just anything that you could think of and i have put it against um all the other ones and it's just ridiculously it's like it's like a kindergarten football team going against the nfl with anything else and you know i'm not going to name drop anything you know any kind of chemical whatever out on the on the store shelf the over-the-counter stuff it's like you know it's 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 mostly the over-the-counter self stuff that you would go to AutoZone or somewhere and you would see it there that's like over-the-counter just like medicine over-the-counter medicine you buy time and all this and that but you can't go buy you know uh, narcotic drugs or you know f- you know other things like that. I got to not got to name drop any drugs or whatever, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, the 3M is the prescription method. Okay, it's much stronger dose. It's much just better everything. All right, so always go with 3M when you can. Okay, when it's prevalent. And you see that spot right there. I always tell everybody um, this is. There's many stages of checking for uh, scratches or blemishes or anything you don't like before you seal it. So when someone tells me, oh, I got to my last method and I have these scratches there and this and that. Okay, so where were the scratches when you did all your checkpoints? Exactly, they were there. So how come you didn't see them? A lot of people get lazy with the headlight restoration, okay? And they're not inspecting, you know, before I do anything, I'm looking over all these spots and this and that. And I'm looking at all these things and I'm checking out to make sure that whatever is there is is going to be gone when I spray it. Okay, it's going to be filled. It's not going to be seen. It's not going to be there. There are and you have to learn how to distinguish between um, little tiny nicks that that aren't are nothing that will be covered with the um, clear coat. Okay, that'll be filled in with the clear coat because it's self leveling and it's filling. Okay. If it's made for headlights, that's what it's going to do, okay? And, um, you, you know, you have to go over it. Like, this is just like the third checkpoint. The one before this would have been after I did the P or after I did the 3000. Another one would have been after I did the 800 just to kind of gauge, um, you know, where they're at, okay? Um, always use your mask, okay, when you use this part. This is the number one thing. I don't, you think the dust will mess up your lungs or whatever? Not compared to this. This stuff will really mess you up. You'll have a bad week if you breathe this stuff in. So a warning, don't do that. But anyways, I always say, like, you know, where is, you know, where was your checkpoints? I check everything and then if i see it right there i'm just gonna uh you know go ahead and take it down to that area and redo it or i'm gonna take it down in this area and redo it before i spray because once you spray it's there it's harder to take off so i mean it's nothing just to keep you know spot checking all these places you don't have to do the whole light if there's just a scrape here or here or here or here you just have to do that one area all right but look at the luster in this light. Look how beautiful this is here. It um, uh, kind of sucks because I'm in the sun. So um, what I'm seeing here is a lot more prettier than this. Sometimes the sun has a weird, like I'm directly in the sun. Um, and sometimes the sun will have a little adverse effect on uh, how you can view it or how the camera picks it up. Just because you can see all this reflection in there. That's uh, pretty much the uh, mirror finish, the, the UV coating activation in there but there are some weird little angles here uh, I wish I could give it justice to how clear it really is in person or how perfect it is in person but it's hard with this uh, being in the sun like this but uh, as you see this method is flawless 
uh, and this is a beautiful rare Lexus. Look at that. Look at how the inside is. Look how pretty these lights are. But I'm literally like an inch away from this light. Look at it. Perfection. No scratches, no blemishes, no nothing. Why? Because I have those checkpoints. You should really be checking after each thing. But check this bonus out. I did some more stuff. So on this vehicle, I did some more um, stuff. That's right, scratch removals and things. Check out this scratch removal. This is on the back quarter panel here. Look at that. Uh, black always has scratches. Now check out the scratch removal here. And check out the scratch removal here on this black finish. And check out this scratch removal there. There I am. Say hello. Look how beautiful that is. Check this out here. This is the same vehicle, a paint restoration or correction and swore removal. Uh, got bars. Check it out. Why is this study important? The study is important because driving at night is three times as risky as driving during the day. The Headlight Restoration Pro. 